Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. God's a good God, isn't he? He really is. And uh, th there are a couple of truths that, that I want to give you, first of all, about the, the goodness of God. One is uh, he is our provider. He is our provider. Uh, he, some of you are here this morning and and maybe you lost your job. Maybe you got a, a bad report from the doctor. Maybe there's too much month at the end of the money. I, and, and a lot of these things that you have been depending on for your security, that rug's been ripped out from under you. And uh, you've discovered something that God's been wanting you to find out for a very long time, um, that your relationship to him is the only thing that you can't lose. Uh, you can lose everything else, but you can't lose your relationship uh, with God. So we're in verse 1 today of Psalm 23, and, and the Bible says, The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. And what God is really saying in this passage is that I don't want you to find security in anything else but me. Uh, I am your security. I am going to provide and to meet your every need. The Lord is my shepherd. That means I'm a sheep. Now sheep are probably one of the most defenseless animals that God ever created. Uh, they don't have any claws. They just got hoofs like that. Uh, their teeth are not very sharp. Um, they are slow as they can be. Uh, they're, they're not the sharpest pencil in the box. They, they have really some intellectual challenges about them and they are the prey to predator after predator after predator and God says to them he says I want to be your need meter I will feed you I will lead you and I will meet your needs the Lord is my shepherd so the shepherd feeds he leads and he meets needs now let me Here's another little parenthetical sermon that I'll throw out there in a sentence or two. Uh, keep, keep in mind, you as a parent, you moms and your dads, that is the role that you are to play with your children. Uh, you are to be their shepherd. You are to lead them and you are to guide them and you are to meet their needs. You're to feed them. And if you study the scriptures, you'll also discover that uh, that, that's synonymous with the role of a pastor. He's also considered in scriptures to be a shepherd. He is to feed the sheep, he is to lead the sheep, and he is to meet the needs of the sheep. So uh, God then is our source. He is our provider. Another truth about the goodness of God is that his provisions are abundant. One of the most familiar passages that we quote often in the New Testament uh, comes straight from the writings of Paul to the church at Philippi in chapter 4 and verse 19 when he says my God shall supply all your needs according to the resources that are found in Christ Jesus so he he didn't say um, I'm going to meet some of your needs or most of your needs he said I'm going to meet all of your needs. So he's our provider, but he also provides uh, abundantly to us. Now, he's got a major purpose in doing that for us. When you see the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, God has a purpose behind him being our shepherd. Now, here it is. You ready for this? Well, this is so profound. He doesn't want you to worry. His purpose in leading and feeding and meeting our needs is that he wants to keep us from worrying about anything. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, he says, don't worry about anything or be anxious about anything, but by everything we are to pray. We're to pray about everything. Uh, now, why doesn't God want me spending my time and my energies uh, in worrying. We just finished a series on the Sermon on the Mount and there were a couple of analogies that came out of that. Uh, he gave us the illustration of botany and he gave us the illustration of biology 
uh, when he drew attention uh, to some of what he has created. He said in Matthew chapter 6, he says, your life, now listen to this, because some of you have been convinced by your flesh and by the enemy that you don't matter. But, but he says in Matthew 6, 25, your life is far more important than what you eat or what you drink or what you wear. So don't worry. Powerful statements. Now, um, let, let me just help you with some things here this morning that I think will be very helpful to you on why should we not worry. The, the first one is this. Worrying is absurd. It's absurd. Now, why is uh, there absurdity in the fact that we spend time and energy uh, worrying about stuff? Well, it is absurd. Now, here, here it is. It's absurd because typically we worry about the wrong things. We worry about things that have absolutely no eternal significance whatsoever. If you're going to worry about anything, and Scripture says don't worry, your life is more important than what you wear and it's more important than what you put in your body. So why worry about it? I'm a good shepherd. I'm going to meet every need that you have. So why do you worry about these wrong things? You stand in front of a mirror and you worry about what you look like. You worry about the fact that you're going to, about to be late for a meeting is out there. And those are just external things. And they don't have any, they're not going to let five years from now, it won't matter a hill of beans. If you're going to worry about something, and you shouldn't, but worry about things that have eternal significance about it. Then second, you can't change anything. We worry about things, uh, the wrong stuff, and, and we worry about things that we can't change to begin with. Um, here's this warp sense that we have about us sometimes is that if we, if somehow we have the concept that if we worry about it, that we have some kind of control over it. You parents worry about your kids when they're not right under, you know, your gaze and they're out there and you're worrying all about them and that worry that, well, I've got, if I'm worried about it, then I, I can control it out there. You can't control it. We worry about things, worry about the wrong things. We worry about things that we can't control. And uh, th the third thing is it's irrational to worry. It's irrational. H have y'all noticed something like me? H have you noticed that when you worry about a specific thing that it really makes it worse rather than better and things just kind of grow as a result of it? Somebody says something about you that kind of hurts your feelings. And you get to think, well, do they really feel that way about me? Well, how many other people feel that way about me? I wonder if my friends, do they feel that way about me? Does so-and-so feel that way about me? Is that how the world thinks about me? So have you noticed how that when you worry about it, it actually makes it worse and things grow way out of proportion? Worry is absurd. Worry is abnormal. It's abnormal. Do you know that human beings are the only creation of God that worry? I grew up on a farm and I noticed something. My cow didn't worry. Our horse didn't worry. The chickens in the barnyard didn't worry. Our animals just didn't worry. Human beings are the only creation that actually do uh, worry. It, it's really, when you get to thinking about it, if we're the only creatures that worry, then it's abnormal for us to worry. So in that Sermon on the Mount, uh, he, he draws a couple of things. He, he gets to looking at the birds in the air. And he says, behold the birds. You know, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't build barns, but isn't it amazing? God takes care of them. And then just look at the lilies of the field. Even Solomon in all of his glory wasn't arrayed like them. And, you know, they just spring up and appear for a little while and then pff, they're gone. Isn't it amazing how that God takes care of 
of the birds and God takes care of the flowers. And if he's caring for them, the scripture says, how much more does God love you? And how much more then does God uh, take care uh, of you? We are the only creatures that actually spend any time in worrying, that doubt, that uh, fail the trust test. So it's abnormal. You say, well, preacher, I was just born this way. <laughs> Baloney. You were not born to worry. You learned how to worry. And the fact of the matter is you can learn not to worry. You don't have to go through the rest of your life being a worry ward. You don't have to go through the rest of your life with tension headaches. You don't have to go through the rest of your life suffering from uh, uh, ulcerated colitis. You just don't have to worry. He says, look at these birds. He says, your father knows. That, that's a beautiful statement. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. But your father knows. And then he says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's your father. He's your shepherd. And it's absurd and it's abnormal for you to spend time worrying about things that you cannot control, worrying about th things that you cannot change. Now, the third thing I want to share with you is that, you know, worrying is not accommodating. It's not accommodating. I, I could use a different word there. It's useless for you to worry. The scripture says in Matthew 6, 27, can you add a single hour to your life with worry, you're not going to grow an inch taller. You're not going to go any shorter. You're not going to get any bigger. You're not going to get any smaller by worrying. And you're not going to live any longer. Matter of fact, you're going to live shorter uh, by worrying. Worrying doesn't work. I've got a wooden rocker on the back deck at our house. And I can go out there and I can sit in that rocking chair and I can rock for hours back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And you know what? I can sit there for hours rocking and I'm not going to move one inch. Worrying is the same thing. You can worry night and day and you're not going to add one single iota to your life. It is not accommodating. Let me ask you a question. Can you change, change the past by worrying? Are y'all awake? I mean, really, seriously. Anybody out there? Hello? Can you change the past by worrying? Is worrying going to change uh, the future? Well, if, you, if you're not going to change the past and you can't change the future or fix the future or determine the future, then what? All it does is mess up today. It robs you of God's blessings that he wants to bestow on you for today. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25, the Bible says, a heavy heart will weigh you down. Anybody here ever have a heavy heart? Wow. Well, I've had a heavy heart before. You know, if you're not careful, a heavy heart will lead into discouragement and it will lead into depression. I've had people come to me and say, well, Pastor, I'm just worried sick. Yeah, I get that. Worry will make you sick. Worry will weigh you down. Worry will affect you worse than any eight-hour hard day's work. You'll come home exhausted. You'll come home burdened down. You'll come home weighed down, and you just flop down in a chair and just want to give up. Worrying creates a heavy heart. But let me, let me give, let me give you what, what the wisdom writer said not long uh, before. He, he said this. He said, a heart at peace gives life to the body. 
heavy heart's going to make you sick. But a peaceful heart is one that the Bible says will give you life. Let me give you the fourth. You ready? Say amen if you're ready. Worry is unavoidable. Excuse me. Worry is avoidable. I said unavoidable. That's not true. I don't know where that came from. Get behind me, Satan. I, I, worry is avoidable. Now, how in the world can you avoid worry? Here's the big deal. You ready? God promised to take care of you. If God promised to take care of you, why do you need to spend your time worrying? The Lord is your shepherd. He's promised to feed you. He's promised to lead you. He's promised to meet your needs. When I was growing up, if I had a need that sprung up in my life, I would go to my mom or I would go to my dad and I would explain to them my need. And when I told them about my need, then it was their responsibility to make sure as my mom and as my dad to take care of the need that had sprung up in my life. Uh, and, and, and it was their responsibility to meet it. Now, many of you are worried about stuff that is God's responsibility to take care of uh, in your life. You have, are worrying about and, and, and are holding on with a responsibility that God, ne listen, never intended for you to have to assume. And you're wringing your hands, perspiring, struggling, fretting, worrying about things that God already said, I'm going to take care of in your life. Uh, acting as if you don't have a shepherd who will feed you and meet your needs. Matthew 6, 30 said, if God so wonderfully cares for flowers who appear today and gone tomorrow, won't he surely take care of you? Do you know that you're important to God? Do you know that you're valuable to God? God values you greatly. And if you ever get to questioning the goodness of God, if you ever get to questioning the responsibility that God has assumed for you and over you, if you ever get to questioning whether God's going to take care of you or not, all you have to do is go look at Calvary for a little while. And you'll see how much he loves you. You'll see how much he cares about you. You'll see how much he values you uh, in your life. Now, most of the people in this room this morning, uh, you've already crossed over the line and you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Most of you in this room have already recognized that you're a sinner in need of a savior and turned away from sin and, and, and invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart and into your life. Most of you have already done that. But you're going to get in trouble when you get to the point that you don't think that God's good or that he loves you and that he's not going to take care of you. Here's the deal. Since you have crossed over that line, since you did place your faith in Jesus Christ, since you did trust him with the biggest need that you ever will have in this life, why in the world can't you trust him with the lesser things in life? If you trusted him with the biggest, why in the world are you still doubting and fretting over stuff that doesn't even come close to comparing to what God's already taken care of in your life. Don't doubt your you, you don't doubt your salvation. Then don't doubt that He's going to take care of these lesser things. All right, let me give you number five. You ready? Now this will knock your hat in the creek. So hang on. Worry is atheistic. Worry is atheistic. Now, can you say amen to the fact that God has promised that he would meet every need of your life? Amen. Now, when 
you begin to doubt and worry and fret that he's going to do that, you've all of a sudden you have become an unbeliever. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply some of the things that you're going to need in your life. No. My God shall supply all. Now there are 10 of you that believe that. <laughs> My God shall supply all your needs. Now, I, I did a word study on that word all. You know what it means? It means all. <laughs> it means everything. Every need that we have. So here I am as your pastor to come tell you, worry is a sin. If God promised to meet your needs and you doubt and worry and fret and fear and don't place your trust in it, then it's sin. If you look at Matthew chapter 6 and 32, it talks about the Gentiles and it's implying here that lost people worry about things. Not saved people, but lost people worry about things. By the way, before I go any further, let me just say this uh, in the message. If you're lost, you should worry. Um, if, if God's not your shepherd, uh, you should worry. Uh, but here, here's the reason. <laughs> because you're out there on your own. And you're not depending on God. You're not trusting his will for your life. And, and you're just making it through one day at a time, one step at a time in your own flesh. And, and what God is saying is that you're not an animal and you're not a plant. You are my children. Say the word children. You're my children and I'm going to take care of you. And it's an insult to God every time that you worry. And that you fret. There are 3,000 promises here in the word of God that God has laid out for his children. And you need to quit acting like an orphan when you are a child of God. Now that phrase, he says in Matthew 6, he says, Your father knows, your father knows that you have need of them. How beautiful is that? God, do you know about it? You mean to tell me, Pastor, that God knows about the physical needs that I have in my life right now? Yes. You, you mean to tell me that God knows about the social needs of my life today? Yes. You mean to tell me that God knows the spiritual condition of my life and the needs that are there? Yes. And when you're worrying, you're acting as an atheist that God somehow doesn't know and is not aware and is not able to meet your needs. And that his promises fail. You see, worrying it takes matters into your own hands and you're acting like it all depends on you and everything in life depends on you and you start playing God because that's God's responsibility, not yours. John 14, one is a chapter and verse that most of us pastors will use at some point in time when we're doing funerals and there's a command in there and that command says, let not your heart be troubled. It's not just for funerals. It's not just for grieving. It's all the time. We're not to worry. You say, well, well I really wish I could do that. I wish somehow or other I could get to that point that I, my, my heart would be at peace and I wouldn't worry about stuff. Pastor, how in the world can I do that? Well, let, let me give you three or four things and then we'll close. It's just a little formula. Try to use it in my life. Uh, try, to, try to make it a part of who I am and I hope that maybe it'll help you along the way too. You ready? The first thing is that you want to petition 
the Lord every day. I would just suggest to you that before you ever get out of the bed, you look up to glory and you just say, you know, to, you know, Lord, today I've got all kinds of stuff that is in front of me and uh, I know that you are my shepherd and, and, and Lord, I know that I'm not going to need to worry about what I'm going to be facing today because you're going to meet every need that I have today. So you get up and you put your clothes on and you go on to work and go do what you're going to do. But I promise you before about 10 o'clock, you're going to need to say that all over again. You're getting ready to go into a meeting. You've got a huge decision to make. There's an obstacle that has suddenly confronted you and, and you're just going to have to have to do it all over again and say, Lord, I know you're my shepherd. And I, I really don't have the wisdom that I need to make these kinds of decisions. I, I, don't, I don't have what it takes, but God, you promised in your word that you'll meet every need that I have in my life. But let, let me help you with something. The fact of the matter is, you're probably going to have to do that 10 or 15 times throughout the day. It's not just a one-time deal. Okay? Number two. Um... Position yourself. You're going to petition God, but you're going to position yourself as well. What do you mean by that? Because the only place that Jesus wants in our life is first place. I want to, listen, I watch Christians do this all the time. It drives me nuts. If I'm not careful, I wind up doing it myself. We have a way of compartmentalizing our relationship with Jesus. and We'll give him a key to a particular room in our life or three or four rooms in our life, but, but, but we're going to hold on to, to a key. Well, now this area right here, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep to myself. Do you understand something? Whatever you don't surrender to Jesus as the Lord of in your life will be the very area of your life that you'll wind up worrying about. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If Jesus is not Lord of you as a parent and, and, and your children then will become a source of worry. If the Lord is not over your finances, then your finances become a source of worry. Whatever you don't relinquish over to the Lord and give him first place about it, and the access key to that area of your life will become an area of your life that you consistently and constantly worry about. He wants to be Lord of all your life, not just a room or two here uh, and there. So you have to give him complete control. Let me give you the third one. You're ready, and it sounds a whole lot like the first one, but it is a little bit different. And it is pray. And I would just encourage every one of you to spend time in prayer and let the Lord know. He already knows, but you're just agreeing with him whatever he already knows about. And you just need to say to him, Lord, this is an area of my life that, 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 that I worry about all the time. And so, Lord, obviously, it's an area of my life that I haven't been able to trust you with. And so, Lord, I, I want to I lay this I want to lay this area of my life down before you. I confess that I've held on to it and I've tried to work it out myself. But God, I, I, I really have never trusted you with it. So I want to give that area of my life to you. And I confess it as sin. And I lay it down before you. And I want to give it to you. First Peter chapter 5, the Bible says, Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Now, let, let me help you with something. If you keep trying to handle it yourself, you're going to get in major trouble. If you fail to give your worries over to the Lord and, and you just push it on down inside, something else is going to come along and, and you don't give that to the Lord and you push that down inside, you're going to get in major How many of you have ever taken a Coca-Cola can and shook it up and then put it in the freezer and see what happens? Huh? i tell you what, it'll make a mess, won't it? You, you understand that if you keep shoving this stuff down and don't turn it over to the Lord, you keep adding to it, 
I promise you it's going to explode out the sides of your life and it will destroy your marriage. It'll destroy your home. It'll destroy your job. It'll destroy your finances. It'll destroy your whatever if you don't turn it over to the Lord. It'll be just like that Coca-Cola can when it explodes. Philippians chapter 4 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Listen to this next statement. You've read it, probably memorized it. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Have you, ever, uh, have you ever figured out what the peace that passes all understanding is? If I, if I were to, to ask you, come and describe or explain to the congregation today, what is the peace that passes all understanding? What is that? What would you say? The peace that passes all understanding is illogical. It is a peace in the midst of your life that doesn't make any sense. It's when you lose your job, got the pink slip, dismissed, fired after all of and you walk out of that place on the final day and you just are overwhelmed with peace. You're not worried, just got peace. Or you left the doctor's office and the doctor gave you a horrible report about your physical life and you walk out of that doctor's office and into your house and you're describing it to your family and you've got this amazing peace that has settled upon you when in all actuality, logically, you ought to be falling apart and miserable, but no. Cool as a cucumber, at peace, at rest. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's in control. He's my provider. He provides abundantly so it doesn't make any sense for me to spend any time worrying about the things that I cannot control that I cannot deal with I can't fix the past can't do anything about tomorrow and you know what happens when you're walking in that kind of peace and people know, goodness, he just lost his job. Look at, look at that. Did you hear what the doctor said about her? And look at the way she's reacting. I want what they have. Let me quickly go on. Um, the next P is presume he will take care of you. Presume he'll take care of Watch this in Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. God says, I'm going to take care of you today. The grace for tomorrow won't be there until tomorrow. You won't need it until tomorrow. So I'll give it to you then. I think what he's saying in that passage is don't open up your umbrella until it starts to rain. You know, there are two days that you ought not to worry about. Yesterday and tomorrow. You see, you messed up yesterday because you were worried about today and you're messing up today because you're worried about tomorrow. Johnny Taylor used to sing Every, every once in a while, uh, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. And that's the way it is. You, you understand, if you're worried about tomorrow, what you're winding up doing is robbing yourself of the blessings that God had intended to give you today. 
Now, let, let me quickly say a word here. Um, I, I'm not talking about don't plan for tomorrow. I think you ought to plan. I, I still think the adage is true. Uh, if you fail to plan, you can plan to fail. Especially when it comes to your death's day. I, I think you need to be ready to die. Somebody said, and I believe it to be true, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. And, and some of you have not planned for that day. You, you haven't looked ahead to that day. And, and I think it's vitally important. I think it's eternally important that you prepare for the day that is your last day here on this earth and you better be ready uh, when it comes. And some of you need to do that even before you leave this building. I wonder if you wouldn't just stand with me for just a minute. I, I want to I wrap this thing up. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I, I wonder how many of you need to come uh, and find a place to pray around the altar this morning. And, and maybe a good prayer for you would simply be, Lord, you know, I, I'm a worry ward and I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing that. Uh, pastors just really made me aware that it's absurd for me to worry. It, it's really abnormal for me to worry. It's not advantageous for uh, me to worry. Uh, it has no eternal significance whatsoever uh, in, in my life. And God, obviously, when I'm worrying, it's sending you a message that I don't trust you. And God, I want you to forgive me for not trusting you to meet the needs of my life, whether it's physical needs or social needs or spiritual needs or whatever it may be in your life. Get his forgiveness. Say, God, I, I don't want to expend any more energy whatsoever not trusting you and worrying about this stuff. And God, uh, maybe you need, need, need to pray. Lord, I, I want you to be Lord of my life in every single area. I have a problem worrying about my kids. I have a problem worrying about money. I have a problem worrying about my job. I have a problem worrying about my marriage. I have a... Those are red flags that go up in our life that really question the goodness of God. And you just need to get forgiveness for that. And it's an area of your life that is not surrendered totally to the Lordship of Jesus. And you just need to give him the key to that area and say, you know what? I'm taking my hands off of this. And God, I want you to have control and I want you to deal with this in my life. Some of you need to make preparations for your death day. You need to get ready. Can't remember ever a time in your life where you turned away from sin and placed your faith in Jesus and trusted Him as your Savior. And, and your life really has never changed. You know what? I, I'll just say this. If, if you've never experienced life change, in all probability you're not saved and you're definitely not ready to die. Salvation is a life change. Some of you need a life change. I wonder if you wouldn't right now across the board, would you not just close your eyes for just a minute? Let me, let me pray for those that need a life change. Would you do that with me? If you're ready to turn from sin and place your faith in Jesus, I wonder if you wouldn't pray something like this with me right where you're standing. Heavenly Father, fact of the matter is I'm not ready to die if I were to die right now I know I wouldn't go to heaven because my sin has separated me from you Heavenly Father forgive me of all my sin I receive you into my heart and into my life Father, with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. 
Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.